Hello, my name is Lynn Hilton Wilson, or Lynn, and I'm thrilled to be able to share with you some insights on Joseph Smith in honor of the 200th anniversary of the Restoration. And as we celebrate the first vision this year, I've organized 12 to 16 lectures as part of an institute group for our community here in California. And I'm thrilled to be able to open up the doorways to new ideas and deeper insights into the prophet. This is an area where I've put in much research and study for my dissertation, and my thesis was that even though Joseph appears to be his Yankee roots coming out of the similar thoughts and of his environment, he is actually making a dramatic um, difference. And as we look specifically at his um, theology and his studies on the spirit and the Godhead and scripture, he makes an abrupt and radical departure. But I want to jump in, first of all, today with a little bit of background on how his family was prepared and watched over. And I am convinced that in my heart, every person is prepared and watched over and every person has a divine history that is important. But Joseph's really stands out because it was so well documented and we have some great information on his relatives. Some of the books that I really appreciate on this one are um, written by people who study Joseph and others are just people who've studied the Second Great Awakening. And we have some fabulous resources at our fingertips. And um, I'm using them and I'll include them in my handouts for you to, if you'd like to, for further study. I want to start with just his grandparents, both on the Smith line with Asel and Mary Duty, and on the Mac line with Solomon, Mac, and Lydia Gates. And both grandparents were active in the revolution in supporting it and in the wars, and both grandparents had long traditions of being in America well before the 18th and 19th century. They came for religious freedom and had a lot of roots that were deeply embedded into the Puritan community. But I want to just touch on some of the wonderful things about Solomon Mack and Lydia Gates. Now, Lydia was a daughter of a Presbyterian deacon. And in order to be a deacon, you have to be well-respected in the community. You have to be very pious. You have to be a firm um, believer, well-educated. And at that time, a Puritanism was saturated with Calvinistic thoughts. And L Lydia, growing up in that environment, became um, a very s similar and devout member of the Presbyterian Church. But when she got married to Solomon Mack, who did not share her beliefs, and they moved up to Vermont, they did not have the opportunity to ch attend church very often. And um, when, in order to understand it, I want to go and talk a little bit about Vermont for a minute. Um, it didn't receive its statehood until 1791. And as soon as it did, that very year, the population increased by 300%. We go from about 85,000 in 1790 and till 20 years later in 1810, we're at 200,000. You have this enormous population, but they're all very young. Two thirds of the population are under the age of 26. And they're filled with all sorts of people that they were called heretics. Starting with, even before the revolution, before it was a state, people like Thomas Paine and Ethan Allen, who um, wrote common sense and um, spoke about the Scottish common sense philosophy. And a lot of the early thought of the revolution comes from their writings that got all the rabble rousing going to rebel against King George. And also in the second great awakening and in the enlightenment period, you have this wonderful emphasis and desire to have reasoning and logic. And because they are, um, these ideas seem to be contrasted with Puritanism, you get a lot of labeling of heretics. So, as good Massachusetts Bostonian Puritans do, they formed a group of missionaries and sent up hundreds of missionaries to Vermont to try to reclaim some of these heretics back to their reformed roots. And we have these huge revivals in 
1810 to 1811 that affected both grandfathers and we'll talk about them as we as we go on but this population exodus did not last because of thomas jefferson's embarcadero the collapse of the vermont bank the year without a summer and so you see a decline almost as quickly as you see an incline in the population also the challenge of trying to farm in vermont where the soil is so thin um, was really a struggle and so we see all four grandparents um, not lasting in Vermont over many generations, but, but changing. So let's um, continue on with Lydia and Solomon. Um, Solomon Mack is this great sailor, and he runs a ship um, as a captain from New England, clear up through New Brunswick and up through Nova Scotia and back. And he is home very infrequently. I believe they had eight children. So he had to be home sometime. But um, he is on this ship for months at a time. And Lydia is left to raise the children and run the family. The challenge is they're out in the sticks. They don't have great church meetings um, or buildings to go to. She's holding their church services in the home. She's holding, she does homeschooling. She's keeping the farm going. She's really a remarkable woman and she's a devout Presbyterian. As we look at some of those um, beliefs that are included in that, the Presbyterians are one of the earliest Reformed traditions, and they held very firmly to the Calvinistic doctrine of TULIP, which re represents total depravity, unlimited election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. All of these are affiliated with the idea that God is in complete control, and he will choose who is elect and who will be damned. And humanity does not have much choice. It is the divine who makes that choice. The crazy thing for me on this is how did it motivate people to be righteous when there was, but they had this belief that if you did good, that meant you were one of the elect. Um, and if you did bad, you were one of the damned. And it was a very black and white world. And this is where Lydia is raised, and she passes this on to her youngest daughter, Lucy Mack, who becomes Joseph's mother. Um, as we continue on, though, and look at um, the time of Joseph's birth, I'm going to skip ahead to Joseph's birth slide. He is born in Lucy Mack's, I mean, in, excuse me, in Lydia and Solomon's home, and they are only there for a few years, Joseph's parents move eight times in a 20 year period. And most of them are circling around, um, the rest of the family members, aunts and uncles and grandparents. But this, but Joseph is born at the Mac farm on December 23rd, 1805 in Sharon, Vermont. And he learned much from his grandparents. And he even shares this sweet story, um, how he has memories of them later on in his life, which we'll touch on in a, in a few minutes. But when we get to um, Joseph's fifth year, there are many camp meetings in Vermont, um, 1810, 1811. And one of them, Solomon Mack, is converted. And he becomes a devout Christian. By this time, all the years of sailing and um, hardships of the weather have taken its toll. And he's a crippled man. And he writes this wonderful narrative and becomes an itinerant preacher. And we can still find copies of his autobiography, this short little pamphlet that he wrote about his faith. And let me just read you some of these beautiful, heartfelt thoughts. God did appear for me and took me out of the horrible pit and miry clay and set my feet on the rock of Jesus Christ. The remainder of my days, I mean to spend all my father's service, though a poor cripple, I have a love of all the rich and the poor, kings and nobles, black and white. Come all to Jesus, my friends, to Jesus, and he will in no wise cast you off. 
Oh, come, come, how sweet is the love of Jesus. How beautiful is the love of God. This invitation is from my heart. So by the time Joseph has memories, his grandpa is an itinerant minister. And he goes along. In fact, he he was so crippled that he could not sit on a donkey properly and had to sit side saddle um, and went around preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wonderful, devout man. On the Smith side of the family, I guess I should first share with you one that both the grandparents agreed to. Uh, both grandpas were part of the revolution. And Joseph remembered a love of liberty that was diffused into my soul by my grandfathers while they dandled me on their knees or they bounced me up on my knees. And both of his grandpas fought for the cause of liberty in the different wars. And both um, were absolutely enthusiastic about the need for human liberty, both politically and religiously. As we look at now at the Smith line and just share a few details about Asel and Mary's life. We have so many wonderful stories to share, starting first of all with Asel. He had such integrity that um, when his father was very old, he had gotten into some debts and Asel refused to leave Massachusetts until he had paid off his father's debts. And he spent years doing so. And it wasn't until he was almost in his forties with eight children in tow that he and Mary Duty are allowed to leave um, Massachusetts after they've paid off the, the land debt and moved up to Vermont where he wanted to raise his family in Tunbridge. He becomes well, for five generations, they've been living in Massachusetts, just north of Salem, and they really um, made an impact in the community. We see their names in uh, city councils and and different um, either volunteer positions or elected positions, and it's it appears that they were very well respected in their community, and Asel and Mary Duty carry that well-educated, refined tradition with them as they join the heretics up in Vermont. And the amazing thing is, um, Asel has a love of the Lord, but a distrust of many of the Puritan thought. And there are five congregational ministers up in Tunbridge, Vermont, where he is, that are questioning their Puritan thought, and they form a universalist church there. And they all leave their reformed traditions, and they go to the challenging um, world of freedom of religion. The major universalist difference at that time was that Joseph wanted to, uh, excuse me, Asel um, and the other ministers wanted human rights. And Asel wrote this love of the scripture and sound wisdom. He was 56 years old. It's sort of his last will and testament, even though he lives years later, but he wanted his children to have his testimony. And he says, my dear children, let me pour out my heart to you and speak first to you of immortality in your souls. Trifle not in this point. The soul is immortal. You have a deal um, you have to deal with an infinite majesty. You go up upon life and death. Therefore, at this point, be serious. Do all to God in a serious manner. You can see the Puritan roots here coming out. And then he continues on. When you think of him, speak of him, pray to him, or in any way make your addresses to this great majesty, be in good earnest. Trifle not with his name, nor with his attributes, nor call him to witness to anything but which is absolute truth. And then when with sound reason and serious consideration requires it. He goes on and he talks about his desire for the children to stay close physically. And he asks them to always remain spiritually and physically unified as a family. And it's amazing to me how many of them, how many of his children um, accept the restoration and move down and join in um, Kirtland. But they also, before that, they moved down, before the restoration, they all moved down to upstate New York about the time of the year without a summer, about the year before that. And six of the brothers all moved to the county of um, Lawrence, except Joseph Sr. and his wife, Lucy Mack, moved to um, Ontario County. 
And let's move down and talk a little bit about them. These are amazing people. The most interesting part about their courtship is that Lucy Mack had two proposals, one from Joseph Sr. and one from his brother. His older brother was also courting him. And so she made it a matter of prayer and asked the Lord who she should marry. I assume that courtships were much shorter then and that the brothers may um, not have had this long battle. I'm just fascinated with how much tension this would have caused amongst the brothers for after the father has just asked them to be unified and love one another. But Lucy has these two proposals from both Joseph and Jesse Smith, and she has a dream, um, very common in that part of the world at that time to trust in your dreams that they were divine messages. And she sees two trees. Um, one is very steadfast and firm and solid and it does not move and the other blows its leaves when the wind comes through and gently moves and sways with the wind and the message that Lucy received as she envisioned this was that um the Jesse would be immovable when the spirit blew but that Joseph senior would accept truth when it came and so she chose Joseph Sr. Lucy was acting at the time that she met these, her husband as an assistant um, in the store of, his, of her big brother. And she had been such a dear one to them, and they were doing well enough at that time that her big brother gave her $500 as a wedding present. And think again of these people are, are earning you know $125 at the time. And she starts off this wedding with a great... Um, source of income. And then the business partner says, I'll match it and gives her another 500. So she starts out with a thousand dollars. Um, they use that to invest in land. We've got the ginseng tobacco there and they lose it. And, um, that's another story, but it's another great one of their perseverance and their hard work. And, you know, we all learn from our experience. And if, according to what Joseph taught in section 122 verse seven, they too um, allowed this to work for their good, just as we all have to learn from our own experiences. But l l years and years later, as Lucy is writing her autobiography or else dictating her autobiography, which was transcribed by scribes, um, she re recollected, quote, my husband's mind became excited upon the subject of religion, yet he would not subscribe to any particular system of faith, but contended for the ancient order as established by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and his apostles. There were so many um, Puritans at the time who vied between Congregationalism, Presbyterianism, a few Baptists, Dutch Reformed, um, Anglican, which of course after the restoration, after the um, revolution became known as Episcopalians, but those were the major faiths and they all were based on this Calvinistic tulip. And, th and after the um, first great awakening and the revolution in the second great awakening, we have this rising interest in more individual thought and individual choice. And we see that in people like Joseph Sr. He doesn't trust um, the organized religion. He goes to the Bible. He wants a restoration. Alexander Campbell does the same. And we have many small groups of disciples and um, Church of Christ that grow up in New England that also are turning back to this New Testament to look to see how religion should be made. But Joseph and Joseph Sr. and Lucy have this wonderful experience in Vermont with all these um, revivals going on where Joseph Sr. begins having seven divine dreams. And I'm just going to share a little bit about a few of them with you because they're fascinating. And it's so sweet to see how God works with different people. And I'm one of those who is convinced that the societies that believe in dreams, the Lord talks to them in dreams. And the societies that do not, he will not. In fact, one of the old Jewish um, proverbs is, if the Lord is pleased with you, he'll give you a good dream, a good king, and, and plenty of rain. 
and they held to dreams. And we know in African cultures today and in many of the island cultures today, dreams are valid sources of God's word. That's how it was during the Second Great Awakening, at least amongst um, these heretics from Vermont. And the first dream came to Joseph Sr. when he was in... um, Royalton. And there's an account written by his wife that he shared. It goes like this. I seem to be traveling in an open barren field. As I was traveling, I turned my eyes toward the east and the west and the north and the south, but I could see nothing save dead fallen timber, not a vestige of life. Either animal or vegetable could be seen beside to render the scene still more dreary. But the most death-like silence prevailed. No sound of anything inanimate could be heard at all in the field. I was alone in this gloomy desert, with the exception of a tendant spirit, who who was constantly kept by my side. Of him I inquired the meaning of what I saw, and why I I was thus traveling with such a dismal place, he answered thus, This field is the world which now lieth inanimate and dumb in regard to the true religion or plan of salvation. But travel on, and by the wayside you will find on a certain log box the continents of which, if you eat thereof, will make you wise and give you wisdom and understanding. I carefully observed what was told me by the guide, and proceeding a short distance, I came across a box. I immediately took it up and placed it under my left arm, and then with eagerness I raised the lid, and I began to taste of its continents, upon which all manner of beast, horned cattle, roaring animals, rose up on every side in the midst threatening man in the most threatening manner possible, tearing the earth, tossing the horns, bellowing, and the most terrifically all around me. And then finally came so close to me that I was compelled to drop the box and flee for my life. Yet in the midst of all this, I was perfectly happy. Though when I woke, I was trembling. There's a couple things about this which I just love. All seven dreams are a seeker trying to find truth and unable to catch it. And I think this is one reason why he was so adamant about not joining a church because of these, of the reality of these visions in his life or these dreams in his life. The, the, the idea though, that he has a box that's on a log, I hope triggers some people's memories of Joseph's hiding place. When he first gets the gold plates from Angel Moroni in, in, um, from Hill Camora, he places them in a wooden box that was used to store sheets or pieces of glass and that they they were at least 60 pounds and he puts them in this box and to hide them he hides them in an old log in the for one of the points you know he hides them in different places in, in the take out the bricks of the fireplace and puts them there puts them in the barn puts them you know different places in the pail of beans but one of the earliest ones is in this log um, in this wooden box. So that was exciting for me to see this. The second vision is so close to another vision that Joseph will learn about in 10 years from this point. Um, I, actually more than that, this is the second vision was from 1811 and Joseph learns about it in 1829. So 18 years from this time. And I'll just tell the story. Well, no, maybe I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it. I came to a narrow path. This is again, um, Lucy's recording of Joseph Sr.'s second dream. I came to a narrow path, and this path I entered, and when I had traveled a little way in it, I beheld a beautiful stream of water, which ran from the east to the west of the stream, and I could see neither the source nor yet the mouth. Yet as far as my eyes could see, I could see a rope running along the bank of it, about as high as a man could reach and beyond. And it was a low but very pleasant valley in which stood a tree, such as I had never seen before. It was exceedingly handsome, inasmuch as I looked upon it to wonder with admiration. Its beautiful branches spread themselves somewhat like an umbrella, and it bore a kind of fruit in the shape much like a chestnut burr, as white as snow, or if possible, whiter. I gazed upon the same with considerable interest, and as I was so doing, the burrs of the shells or shells commenced to open, and they shed their 
their particles or the fruit which was contained of dazzling whiteness. I drew near and began to eat of it, and I found it delicious beyond description. And as I was eating, I said in my heart, I can't eat this alone. I must bring my wife and my children that they may partake with me. And accordingly, I went and I brought my family, which consisted of my wife and seven children. And we all commenced eating and praising God for this blessing. And we were exceedingly happy inasmuch that our joy could not easily be expressed. And while thus engaged, I began, um, I beheld the spa- a spacious building standing in opposite of the valley, which were in it were appearing to be, to reach the very heavens. It was full of doors and windows, and they were all filled with people who were very finely dressed. And these people observed us in the low valley under the tree, and they pointed the finger of scorn at us and treated us with all manner of disrespect and contempt. But their, they continue, um, but their community we uttered disgust guarded and I present and I presently turned to my guide and inquired of him the meaning of the fruit that was so delicious and he told me that it was the pure love of God shed abroad to the hearts of all those who love him and keep this his commandments he then commanded me to go and bring the rest of my children I told him that they were all here and he said no (laughs) look yonder and they have two more and interestingly, if you note the year here, Joseph Sr. and Lucy do have other children after this point. Um, and he brought them to the tree. And I saw the, um, the small children standing at a distance. And the more we ate, the more we seemed to desire it until we even got down upon our knees and scooped it up, eating it by the double handfuls. After feasting in this manner a short time, I asked my guide what was the meaning of the spacious building and the inhabitants thereof. And he was... Um, and he replied, it is Babylon. The people and the doors and the windows and the inhabitants thereof who scorn and despise the saints of God because of their humility. I soon awoke, clapping my hands together with joy. Okay, so this is 1811. And there are so many similarities to Joseph Smith's Tree of Life vision that I just want to point this out. When Joseph is doing the translation of the Book of Mormon, he starts, of course, with the uh, with um, Oliver's I mean, without, with Emma as his scribe, and they go through the book of Lehi, the 116 pages, those are lost. When he returns to the translation process months later, and Joseph is allowed to receive the plates again from Moroni, it appears to me, and John Welch and everybody who does serious research on this, that he starts in Mosiah, and he goes clear through Moroni, and then... We have words of Mormon and the small plates. And so Joseph has gone through, he's a, he's an expert translator by the time he gets the small plates and he finally gets to first Nephi and he sees this vision. And I have to pause and just say, we are told in the program price that baptism has been around since the time of Adam. And the Lord often gave his prophets similar visions, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, the throne theophanies have so many things in common, even Jacob's book of Revelation. Um, And these throne theophanies, I think, share something especially similar when it's father and son. And I have to just pause and think when Joseph has a dream, the angel tells him, tell your father. His father was his dreamer. His father believes Joseph because he had had similar experiences. And then when Joseph comes to this part in the Book of Mormon, he is validating his dad as a prophet, as a man of God, as well as his own tradition. I just feel like this must have been a very unifying thing. Finally, in 1829, when Joseph gets to this part of the translation. So that was a sweet correlation. There were differences. You know, there's a rope and um, the burrs of a chestnut obviously are very different and the double scoop handfuls. You know, it's a different dream. It's a different experience. But so many similarities, just like Lehi and Nephi were, were different in their right. I'm going to skip down through some of these other visions, um, but they each have this searching wanderer who is looking for um, more light and truth. And... The sixth vision, he is walking alone again, 
and he's fatigued and he comes he thinks he's in heaven and he wants to get into the heaven's doors but they're closed he's told he's too late um and he's constantly seeking for more light and truth and doesn't get it but the seventh vision is the one that i want to read a little bit about uh, next because it um is the last one he receives and it's now 1819 and his guide is beside him this time dressed as some sort of a peddler and joseph um, senior is describing this to his wife who records it sir says the guide will you trade with me today i have now called upon you seven times i have traded with you in each time and have found you strictly honest in all your dealings and this is the last time that i shall ever call on you and there is but one thing which you lack in order to secure your salvation so joseph senior says would you write it down for me i have missed this with every dream and i don't want to miss it this time will you write it down for me and um, the guide says, yes, I will. And in Joseph Sr.'s excitement to get it written down, looking for his quill and paper, he wakes himself up and he doesn't hear it. But fortunately, this is 1829 and he hears it very soon after this. So this is just an amazing family that Joseph is being raised in where the gifts of the Spirit are a reality. They are not. And this was a very important um differentiation and point of contention in early religious history um and i want to just share a little bit about lucy mack and then i'll go back and talk about the revivals but lucy mack his mother also experienced the um gifts of the spirit but she was one who received the gift of healing and the gift of prophecy in 1802 um sweet so um her daughter was very sick and um or was it her um herself i don't remember if it was herself or her i think it was herself in the 1802 and she promises the lord that if the lord would spare her life she will raise her children to receive christ and um then years later a child gets very sick her daughter and they call in the doctor and the doctor um, watches as the little girl's eyes set and she stops breathing and the doctor s pronounces her dead and leaves and Lucy and Joseph Sr. kneel beside the child's bed and plead to the Lord for healing and Lucy scoops up the, the lifeless body and starts pacing the room um, and between her sobs is pleading with the Lord to restore the life of this little one. And after quite some time of pacing the room, the child breathes again and is restored to life. We have other examples of Lucy's healings, and the best source for these are Levina Fielding and, um, Anderson's book called Lucy Book. But there's also other s sources um, where we have Lucy's autobiography that have other accounts of these but she was a great woman of faith and i see a change in lucy's life during this 1816 move where her husband has gone down a prior to upstate new york to find housing and she is left with the children and alvin takes one wagon and they hire out the next wagon um with help to transport their goods down and you know the story he's a scoundrel he um, takes advantage of them and unfortunately the family is left in a in a desperate situation the recordings sometimes said that lucy had to sell the eardrops that actually referred to the drops that were in her daughter's ears they were earrings they're earrings and she's selling the earrings not not the drops in order to pay some of the last bills but other accounts of this same journey where lucy has to take charge of the wagon and the family and we see this really preparing her for the same kind of exodus that occurs in kirtland years later but i really admire her faith and her tenacity during this time there in america women could not um, vote of course they couldn't own property they didn't have rights and yet she is put in a position where she is forced to protect her family and I just admire her really highly when they arrive in upstate New York 
um, the second great awakening is in full swing and revivals become the norm. People are living in small little towns. Upstate New York has only opened since 1790. And it's only, you know, 20 years later that they begin building religious affiliations. The first thing you have to do is homes and food and then religion and then education. And so people like, um, um, I could list many, many, but my favorite one is a book called um, The Burned Over District. Describe how as the Erie Canal was being built, we were able to move ahead and um, we see the um, cities growing and prospering and religion taking over. And all of Joseph's um, fam- Joseph Sr.'s family moved down to Lawrence County and then um, Joseph Sr. and his family moved down into Ontario. And the revivals of this time period become the norm in this area. And it's, and it receives the name, the burned over district because of all the itinerant preachers who burned through. And it was a tinderbox for the spirit and the baptism by fire that came out of all these revivals were just powerful in Rhode Island we found six during the years 1815 to 1818, Connecticut, 15, Pennsylvania's larger, more populated, 21, likewise, New Jersey, 21, Eastern New York around Manhattan, that area, 21, but Vermont, the land of the heretics, we have 45 revivals. Um, Massachusetts is probably the best known for, um, the religious Puritan thought initially, and they have 64 revivals. But when you come to this brand new burned over district, sparsely populated, there are 80 revival activities in the year between 1815 and 1818. And in addition to that, um, what Brother Bushman found in the years 1819 to 1820, that 50 of these tiny little towns in upstate New York and this burned over district actually documented revival activity. So it's this growing interest in the second great awakening. And then in, um, in July of 1819, the Methodist conference is held just 16 miles south of Palmyra. And we have an enormous influx of ministers coming from all over the area to this, um, conference and they preached on the way in and they preached on the way out. Methodism takes hold of the Western movement because most um, Presbyterian and Reformed faith required their ministers to go to an a university to have an education. This is why we have all the Ivy League schools. It's their divinity schools. They had to be trained and taught in um, theology in order to preach. And you couldn't be a minister unless you had this devout and thorough, pious education. But the Methodist had a completely different approach. Instead, um, I, I'm specifically thinking of, of one famous Methodist minister at this time, Peter Cartwright. He seeks for um, the power at a revival. He's trying to find the spirit. And he comes across... Um, months and months and months of scripture reading and prayers until he finally at age 16 feels the spirit powerfully. He stands up, he testifies that God lives and he's immediately asked if he'll serve a mission, if he would like to be a minister. And he begins his 50 year career as a minister. At that point he was illiterate. He had to learn to read because as, um, Methodist ministers received their hymnal, their prayer book, um, and their Bible and $40 a month. And that's how he started out on his donkey. And he looked, taught himself to read as he went about, but because there's so many little towns, you still only get one of these itinerant ministers about every month to come through your place. And so the revivals really were the hot, exciting spots at the time. But in upstate New York, um, Methodism takes over. And as you look at the history of Americans, uh, uh, excuse me, of the early colonies in 1800, there are four major religions and very few others. The Congregationalists are Calvinist, Presbyterian are Calvinist, 
Many Baptists are Calvinists, some are less, and the Episcopalians. All of them have strong Puritan roots, trailing far, far behind are the Methodists and Calvinists. But within a 50-year period, we see a major change in the United States, and Methodism becomes the number one religion. With all the influx of the Irish and the Polish and the Italians, we have Roman Catholics coming in second, and Baptists maintaining, and then continuing on with the Presbyterians, Congregationalists. But we have a new group called the Disciples of Christ, and they are those who are looking back to the New Testament. Those are the churches of Alexander Campbell and of Stone and many others who felt strongly about finding truth only in the Scripture. This was the environment of the Joseph Smith's first vision. This is the background that prepares us to next week talk about the next generation down, Joseph and his family, as they arrived and dealt with this marvelous outflowing of the Second Great Awakening. It's absolutely a fascinating time in history, and I hope that this has just been a little taste to pique your curiosity into reading more. The more we understand about history, the more patient we are with understanding Joseph and his family. And the deeper we dig, the more deeply I believe that he was a prophet of God, called and set apart from the foundations of the earth, and his family were watched over. I likewise believe that each human being is watched over, and God has a mission for each of us. I look forward to sharing more thoughts with you next week. I have a question. So this is Marshall Hancock, and I've, I've enjoyed absolutely every minute of listening to this this lesson. I want to have a quick question about was it eight years, eight eight moves in ten years, or eight moves eight in moves 10? in twenty years, eight, eight moves in twenty years. Yeah, and many of them are very close, but it's 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 you can see as if God is moving the chess players on the board um, because they moved down to West Lebanon, which is right next to Hanover, New Hampshire, Dartmouth, right at the time where Joseph has the myelonitis in his leg and he has to have the leg surgery, osteomyelonitis, excuse me. And um, they're in the right place at that time to have that doctor um, right next door um, be able to help there. I just feel like many of the moves were financial, but some of them were absolutely important to be at the right place at the right time. Just how it is in our lives. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's exciting. I'm excited for this year. Great. Thank Thanks you. Bye bye. I said 10 years and 